Salve, divanots, and welcome back to Cronista de Indias, the Her Story YouTube channel by Dr. Andrea Lorena Fernandez. Please follow on Instagram or subscribe below and subscribe below uh, on the link below uh, for more cultural content. Check out my podcast at Why We Read This uh, with Dr. Rebecca Salas on classics and pop culture. Links in the description. Thanks for supporting my research. It's been a while since I've uploaded. I'm committed to completing the, the Diva season and creating more content from here onwards. Stay tuned. In the last episode 22, titled Sufragistas, Ernestina Lopez, keynote at the Argentina's first International Women's Congress of 1910, we discussed the contributions of Ernestina Lopez to the suffrage movement. We also discussed the relationship between education and patriotism in her speech. In this current episode 23, it's titled Soldaderas Part 1, a women's her story of the Mexican Revolution in popular culture from 1910 to 2000. First, we'll discuss the military period with the soldaderas. Then, we'll do the organizational period represent, represented by Nelly Campobello and Frida Kahlo. And the last will be the conservative period represented by Maria Felix and Dolores del Rio in the movie La Cucaracha, directed by Ismael Rodriguez in 1959. For this presentation, I rely on Elizabeth Salas, the Soldadera in the Mexican Revolution, War and Men's Illusion. Also following Mary Kay Vaughan, links below. The first period is 1910 to 1920. This is also known as the military period and it's the one of the fighting phase. Men and women were equally valuable in the Mexican Revolution. The peasant armies of 1910 and 1920 become the modern male military machine that we exist today. Traditionally, armies relied on women for cooking, healing, spying, supplying, and logistics. In the north, Pancho Villa, and in the south, Emiliano Zapata are the characters that you most know about. These were folk armies and there were folk migrations. The federal army conscripted women and rebel forces swelled with numbers. Lack of officer corps meant that women ranged from cooks to soldiers to spies to sharpshooters and officers and mercenaries. Women's companies were multiracial and of all socioeconomic extraction. Most joined because of a male that was joining before them. While men traveled on horseback, the soldaderas went on foot or on top of the railroad cars where they could flip tortillas without being a safety hazard. Some women joined for, joined for employment. Soldiers, keen to hire women's cooking as they wouldn't eat anything that men prepared, were already ready for them. Transferring motherhood to the battlefield was something that the soldaderas did. One third of the Pancho Villa army was soldaderas. The masculinization of the revolutionary peasant army happens after 1914. Pancho Villa institutes an all-male elite cavalry, Los Dorados. These cavalry units were increasingly, increasingly abandoned soldaderas and children to avoid capture, using them as living buffers. Villa saw soldaderas as an obstacle to the modern all-male army. In 1917, the constitutionalists, inspired by Venusitano Carranza, order rebels to disband and enter the official army. They eliminate soldaderas from the popular imagination, except to be objects of repulsion or desire. They have no respect and compensation as veterans. They could only get pensions if they had male relatives that fought in the war. Poor soldaderas could not mobilize politically and middle-class women shunned them for having fought and worn pants. The Mexican mass media and its most acclaimed artists turned the soldadera into something digestible for the patriarchy. in the organizational period. The same recipe they had always tried to sell us to replace multifaceted womanhood, they reduced to the virgin and the whore. The soldadera becomes a prostitute, a self-abnegating patriot, an Amazon susceptible to romantic love, or obscuring and obscuring their contributions. We'll go to the organizational period now. This is 1920 to 1940. This is the period when, where Nelly Campobello and Frida Kahlo thrive. Okay, saying this once, the Mexican Revolution is one long, prolonged failure. Don't believe me? Look at the wealth disparity in Mexico. End of discussion, moving on to nation building, more important things. A government of la raza cosmica, the cosmic race, af uh, after the title by José Vasconcelos, who was Mr. Minister of Education and Public Arts. The Mexico of the 1930s was a progressive nation, 
progress was in the air. There was resurgence in scholarship on Mexicanidad. This was common in other Latin American nations who were self-fashioning into modern state. It's also a time ripe with socialist intellectual organizations. We will focus on education here because teachers were mostly women. This indigenista trend is an example of the Pan-Americanism. Teacher politicians revolutionized their governments. Some notable ones are Gabriela Mistral from Chile, Pedro Enriquez Ureña from the Dominican Republic, Raúl Aya de la Torre from Peru, José Vasconcelos, as we said earlier, was a progressive and encouraged the indigenista cultural movement to move Mexico towards an indigenous past while reclaiming the present, or vice versa. The first generation of women who attended the Vasconcelos reformed public school system gave us Campo Bello and Calo. According to Lillian Estelle Fisher in The Influence of the Present Mexican Revolution Upon the Status of Women, factors favoring women's education in the 1920s included the consolidation of the Mexican state, government subsidization of schools, curriculums negotiated by communities and teachers, and changing mentalities about economic conditions. Lastly, technology freed women from housework. Think of vacuum cleaners and gas stoves, irons, detergent cleaners, all of that helped. Literacy and schooling subvert the patriarchy. A post-revolutionary agrarian, agrarian reform strengthened rural patriarchy. Women couldn't own ejidos, for example, land plots. Education met resistance. It empowered women as homemakers and social managers of children. They also saw role models in teachers, nurses, and phone operators and promoted gender equality. They also saw the emergence of adolescence and patriarchy was muted by pragmatism. Women's education improves everyone's lives. They couldn't lie about that. The Chicas Modernas emerge in the organizational period. This is part of the female urban proletariat experimental womanhood of the 1920s. They wore makeup, dancing, dating, no corsets, they went bathing suits, sports, they read radio, no they heard radio novelas, they wore short hair, they were inspired by those flappers in Hollywood movies, sent telegrams, and went on international travel. See episode 20 for a longer explanation of La Chica Moderna. To summarize here, they attacked Victorian Marianista sexual mores, women dem demanded revolutionary rights, and the pelonas, or short-haired flapper girls, openly contended with criticism from conservative Catholic women, las damas católicas. The 1940s is the codification of maternalism and mestizaje as the Criolla magazine model uh, becomes the norm at the expense of diversity. Let's go to period number three, 1940s to 2000s, the conservative period with Maria Felix and Dolores del Rio. This, here we're gonna cite La Cucaracha, a movie from 1959. The PRI, or Partido Revolucionario Institucional, and telenovelas enforced traditional gender norms. In 1946, Miguel Aleman becomes the first civilian president of Mexico since Francisco Madero in 1911. In the post-World War II years, Mexico undergoes great industrial and economic growth. Even at the, as the gap continues to grow between rich and poor of segments of the population. The ruling government party, founded in 1929, is renamed as the Partido Revolucionario Institucional, or PRI, P -R -I, and will constitute dominance over government for the next 50 years. In 1953, women gained the right to vote. Telenovelas and PRI enforced gender norms. I'm citing from the Oxford Encyclopedia of History. Telenovelas continue to be the romantic kind, set up suspenseful, even comical situations that define the tragedy of love gone bad or the melodramatic destiny of starstruck lovers. These romantic melodramas also seem to reflect the national ethos that was expounded by the Partido Revolucionario Institucional's overwhelming control of political power, mimicking a love relationship gone wrong. The comparison here expresses the people as the victim, nostalgically, nostalgically wishing for their amorous counterpart to reappear into their scene in a more egalitarian manner than was really the case. 
Also, in this period, during the 1970s, the large telenovela production company Televisa of El Diablo came into greater control of the production and distribution of telenovelas. For many, the development of this media conglomerated market the marked the transition between media uh, into media control political hegemony for the country, where media control and popular culture went hand in hand in terms of refueling and limiting the country's political imagination. Certainly, telenovelas very much contributed to the financial success of the large Mexican media conglomerates. Unquote, Pibia. Now I'm gonna cite from La Cucaracha by Ismael Rodriguez. It stars my favorite lady, Maria Felix, as Soldadera La Cucaracha, and Dolores del Rio as the demure widow. This is a my film is a microcosm of the telenovelas in film form. The first thing we notice is maternalism and mestizaje. The soldaderas are all whitewashed. Maria Felix is a criolla, hardly representative of the general soldadera population, mostly indigenous. However, we know that women officers came from the middle class and up, so white and literate, like La Cucaracha, are not impossible women to have. The second thing we notice is women's rivalry over a man. The whore is La Cucaracha. She, the femme fatale who rejects femininity and even God. She sells a holy images for tequila in one scene, a pendant that she snatched from the dead in battle. Uh, her short affair with Coronel Zeta leaves her a single mom and a devout Catholic. She's destitute, but in the back in her place. The virgin role is taken by the widow uh, of a rural schoolmaster who dies in fighting, leaving his wife as a camp follower. Coronel Zeta also pursues her, but treats her with deference like a lady. She's widowed but child-free at the end of the film and might receive Coronel Zeta's pension. Lastly, fan service. The audience uh, attended the films to see the beautiful divas performing Mexicanidad that glossed over the soldadera's contribution to history. Maria Felix and Dolores del Rio were rivals in real life and the audience knew it. Dolores was besties with Frida Kahlo, whose husband, Diego Rivera, had a long affair with Dolores del Rio. He was even gonna divorce Frida for Maria Felix. By the time the film was in production through 1959, Kahlo was already dead. The soldadera in pop culture, it becomes the virgin or the whore. There's hope though. That's where Nelly Campovello disrupts the male narrative of the Mexican Revolution with her child narrator in Cartucho from 1938. In conclusion, we discussed it, The Soldaderas, a woman's her story of the Mexican Revolution in pop culture from 1910 to 2000. We reviewed one, the military period, two, the organizational period, and three, the conservative period. In the next episode, 24, we will discuss Nelly Campobello's Cartucho. In this frame tell narrative told from a little girl soldadera's point of view, the author desexualizes women's experience of the Mexico Mexican Revolution to reclaim their legitimacy. Thank you for taking the time to learn more about Latin American divas right here at Cronista de Indias, where new episodes drop. Well, I'm gonna finish the season. Um, I'm gonna drop a new episode weekly or even more than that. So tune in, follow me on Instagram, follow me over here and subscribe. I don't know what the link is, it's somewhere down here. I'll put it in, in one of the corners. I'm a Latina hair historian, CUNY adjunct assistant professor, author, YouTuber, podcaster, Reiki and Santeria practitioner. I believe in public education and deactivating structures, keeping people in debt, like student loans. I create content to combat economic abuse and make education debt free, whether you're in college or not. Thank you once again for subscribing and supporting my research.